Can you see my screen? Uh, can you see my screen? Can yeah, you yeah, confirm? yeah. You can see your slides are fine and clear. Yeah. Perfect. Okay, so if you're ready, we can start. Yeah, sure. Let's go ahead. Okay, I'll go ahead. So good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I welcome you to the fifth talk in the astronomy astrophysics theme of the talk series titled Podartha uh, Pikkanor Ito Hitu Ar Bohutu. Today we have among us Dr. Vishwajit Benerji. Uh, he did his MSc from Calcutta University and obtained his PhD from SINP Kolkata in multi-wavelength view of active galactic nuclei. Uh, he is currently a postdoctoral researcher in Grand Sasso Science Institute working on electromagnetic follow-up of uh, gravitational wave events. He is a member of the uh, LVK collaboration and also an associate member of the Magic Telescope System. Uh, today's talk will be a summary of the past, present and future of multi-messenger astronomy uh, that uses telescope in different wavelengths as well as uh, gravitational wave detectors and to decode the mysteries of the universe. So we are really excited to hear more about it in the talk. And uh, for the information of the participants, uh, uh, I want to tell you that you may ask questions at the end or type the questions in the chat box, which will be moderated as per convenience. So over to you. Uh, please go ahead. Okay. Thank you very much. And uh, first of all, uh, you know, it, it's it's a really a pleasure to present my work and uh, break it down uh, with the understanding. So that, I mean, so we can start from the beginning. Uh, where we started in our masters or bachelors, so it's very good to like share my work in the in in kind of a broader audience. So I hope you will uh, you will enjoy the let let enjoy the time that I'm I'm gonna uh, spend with you. And whenever you have questions, just like just ask. Uh, you can stop me anytime you want, and you don't need to like wait for the end of the the talk. Um, yeah, so today I'm going to talk about the gravitational waves, gamma ray burst, and more. So this title of the talk is a bit fuzzy because it's a lot of things together that I'm going to talk about, and and I want to convince you that these things are really interesting, and there's a huge opportunity that is waiting for all of you who wants to pursue the the career in astronomy, and it's a it's a it's a very nice time, and I'll tell you more uh, why I'm saying so. So um, I'm Vishwajit Banerjee. I'm a postdoctoral researcher in the Grand Sasso Science Institute. I'm also an affiliated member of INFM, uh, LIGO Virgo Collaboration, and an associate member in the Magic Telescope System. And I'll tell you what Magic Telescope System does in general. So moving, yeah. OK, and uh, today my talk will be based on this two uh, papers that, that we wrote in recent times. One is detecting very high energy gamma ray emission from binary neutron star mergers, uh, ETCTA, CTS energies, which is kind of a futuristic approach. We have Einstein telescope for the appearing in 10 years from now. Also, Cherenkov telescope array, which observes the Cherenkov light from the high energy, very high energy gamma rays. And I'll share the details with you how we detect this kind of photons. And this is this is a this project that I'm mentioning here in number one is a futuristic project, and I'll describe uh, what I mean by that. The second one is the detection of the first GV component coming from a binary neutron star merger that was published in Nature last year, and uh, and I'll also share details about that. Here are my collaborators uh, from my institutes, from different institutes in around the world. Um, also, there are uh, I'm collaborating with some Indian institutes uh, like IIT Indore and uh, and Shah Institute of Nuclear Physics, of course. Uh, here is the outline of the talk. So first, I will briefly describe about the gamma ray burst, what we mean by that, and I'll also describe the curious case of 170817A GRB and gravitational wave simultaneous detection. The uh, LIGO Virgo Kagra, which are the present generation gravitational wave detectors, uh, I will update you about what are the next steps that they are going to do. And uh, I will also describe the mysterious GRB 211211A, which where, from where I, uh, we saw the GV emission. Uh, and this is an evidence that from the first, for the first time in the entire human history, that we are seeing a GV component, giga electron volt component from a 
compact binary merger, meaning that two neutron stars colliding together and producing GV energies, which is phenomenal and never seen before, 21, 12, 11n. And I will also describe about the future of my research area, which concerns Einstein telescope, which is uh, a triangular shaped detector um, in, uh, will be placed in, in Europe somewhere, and the Cherenkov telescope array, which is a very high energy gamma ray instrument. Uh, okay, so I'm, okay. If you can give me a while, I'll check why the slides are very small. Uh, okay, just give me a while because they're, they're really small. I, I don't know if I, if you could see them. Okay. I think this is better, right? So maybe I will go with this. Maybe you can see it better on this way. Let, let, let's go ahead with this one. Yeah, yeah. Okay, perfect. Okay, so the, the history of gamma rivers were very curious uh, cases. For example, in 1967, there was the discovery of gamma rivers, and then it evolved over time. In 1970 to 1990, there were dark ages. And then we had several detections from different wave bands, and this is called the afterglow era. And then there, there happened multivalent era and then multi messenger era, which started from uh, 2017 with the discovery of 17017. Now, in the beginning, what, what happened that we saw gamma rivers for the first time? What happened is like we saw, so there was this uh, US satellite uh, called Vela. They were moving, they, that was launched in order to see that if Russia is doing some uh, notorious activities on the ground. Apparently, they saw some events which were not really uh, very fast, as we, we expect from a nuclear burst. They were even they were very longer of uh, of the time scale of seconds, which actually the expectations were microseconds or or very milliseconds. But then we saw something which is huge, and appearing in 0.2 to 1.5 MeV. And that started this uh, curiosity, what that could be. Uh, it, it's not a nuclear test that Russia is making. And then what, what could it be? That was the discovery of the gamma ray burst later, as we know. But then it started um, uh, people wondering about what this, uh, this really is. So in the dark ages of gamma ray burst, we have, like, we wandered around several possibilities. Uh, it could have been, um, I mean, people thought it could be anything in, in principle, starting from uh, an object that is inside our own galaxy. It could be in the cosmological distances. But what we knew for sure was the fluence of, the, of these events, fluence meaning how much energy it is giving away per centimeter square, per unit area that you are measuring. And that was 10 to the minus 5 arcs per centimeter square in the CGS units. With the help of that and the duration, you can, uh, and then you can assume that they are they they are placed in different distances. So if it is inside our own galaxy, the in total energy budget could have been ten to the forty ergs. If it is in the cosmological distances, it can be up to ten to the fifty-two ergs. The more you go in distances, the less fluent it is, and and so then it started. Uh, discussion that if it is really uh, so energetic that it can produce 10 to the 52 ergs of energy. And then the person arrived, uh, Paczynski, who, who first claimed that this is, these gamma ray bursts are at cosmological distances and they are coming from, uh, uh, coming from very distant sources. And that, that ended the dark ages of people wondering about what this, this actually could be. I have one question. So sure. what is the meaning of cosmological distance? Right. The cosmological distance meaning uh, it can be at different uh, redshifts. By redshift, we mean that, I mean, if you try to measure the distances of a star, of any object from us, from, from our planet, so these are the distances that we can measure. So the cosmological distances are like, what are the distances that the objects are placed in, in our universe? So if you look, our, look, look at our universe, it can be, uh, since we know that our universe is, uh, is, is quite old, right? It's uh, billions of years. Yeah. And, and then uh, any, any, so then the universe is expanding. So we have different patches of evolution over the age of the universe. 
And if you place an object which is farther away from us, mm -hmm. uh, it means it is it is it is a cosmological distance. I understand. Thank you. Okay. Welcome. Okay. So uh, after the the dark ages, where we didn't understand anything about gamma ray burst, we started to understand a few things, thanks to the facilities that we we could get. One was Baposak's wild field of view telescope, which had 400 square degrees of field of view. So I will come back to that uh, quite often. Uh, I'll talk about the field of view. This particularly means that with your instrument that you can make, um, what is the sky area that you are covering? So you can have a narrow field of view telescope, which means that you are just looking at the looking at the patch of the sky, and you are looking at a small patch. But if you look at this, uh, so just to give you an impression, like what is the total visible sky that you have is four pi, right? It's it's, uh, it's four pi radian, which means 43,000 43, square degrees. Now with this Baposax wild field telescope, which was an X-ray camera, uh, two to 30, which covered two to two to 30 kV of the energy, it could see a very good fraction of the sky. So anything happening inside the patch of the sky, it could directly tell you if it is a transient light event. And by transient light event, I mean the flux or the number of photons that you are um, you are having you are observing rises very fast and also also fades down, and you have no trace afterwards. So this kind of telescopes are very important, and uh, unfortunately, we don't have any such wide field X-ray cameras. Uh, well, um, apart, from, I mean, we have some, but like uh, this is the first one that we could get. Then, for the first time. Thanks to this bigger field of view, we could have the prompt emission of this transient events. By prompt emission, I mean the emission that is happening exactly at the time, at the start time. So you could directly see the, the rise of the number of photons and then the, the peak disappearing over time. And then that also led to the uh, and and then from there onwards we also tried to saw we tried to see this uh, this kind of peaks which we call afterglow. So there are two phases of emission: one happening at the time exactly at the trigger that triggered your telescope, and then one later, even after uh, ten to the power four seconds. And ten to the power four seconds is roughly around three hours or four hours. Ten to the power five seconds is one day. So you could see exactly when this event is happening, and then one day later where it uh, where it goes. Okay, all right. So um, and then there were, and then with the with the help of these discoveries, we could see we could measure the redshift of the objects, meaning the distance of the objects, and there were the distances were 0.222 uh, of the redshift. So it means that they were really uh, cosm at cosmological distances. Okay, and then we enter into multi-wavelength era from 2004 with the help of even different telescopes. Uh, one of them was Batsy, and then it could see in different energy beams, meaning that you can uh, you can break down the energy band of X-rays, and you can see uh, in different periods, uh, like in different energy bands, from 0.1 MeV up to 0.3 MeV. And this plot on the right that you see, it's called the afterglow uh, of the object 130427A. This I put just to tell you the, uh, the, I mean, how we evolved over time. So right now in this plot, I think my cursor is not really pointing where I, I wanted, wanted it to point, but anyway. So, okay. So exactly what is happening here, you have optical, you have radio, and you have x-rays and 100 MeV. So, Imagine that you have four different bands of observation and you are seeing the same object. So that gives you overview of what is happening in different energy bands. So, yeah. And this is very important because different energies, uh, they tell you what is the emission, uh, emission mechanism that is happening in, in your transient object. Okay. During this multi-wavelength era, with the help of different telescopes, we also understood that these transient-like events are, uh, they have different durations. And this is very interesting because depending on the duration, you can, 
you can really uh, separate out the long and short GRVs. The long GRVs are, they have the duration of uh, two seconds, more than two seconds. And the short, there are also short kind of transit events, which uh, which just like, which which appears for a, for less than one seconds or around two seconds. And this also created this, um, and with the help of that, we also understood that the emission mechanism of GRBs can be prompted through, um, through the mechanism that you have a central engine, which accretes, uh, I mean, which can be produced from a black hole, um, for, from a collapse of a massive star. It can also be two stars merging each other, I mean, inspiring with each other and merging at the same time, producing a different, producing a jet. And then the, when the jet is jet is propagated, uh, it can make several ejectors. The ejectors can collide with each other and can produce the internal shocks. And you have the prompt phase of emission. This uh, shock, when it moves through the interstellar medium, it can it can decelerate, and uh, and it can produce the afterglow. So this is how the entire emission. And whenever it just it produces, whenever this shock evolves over time it gives you different uh, as you can see here the i mean if you produce gamma rays in different uh, epochs of this uh, of this evolution you also produce x rays and visible lights so so this is why having different wave band is helpful because you understand what is happening in this internal structure of the jet So as we know so far, there are two progenitors of uh, short and long gamma ray bursts, different progenitors for long and short gamma ray bursts. The short gamma ray bursts are produced by, as we know so far, two compact binary, two compact uh, mer mergers. So it can be neutron star and neutron star mergers. They merge together, they produce a disk, and also it's, and they produce very fast jets in both of the directions. Um, it can also be a collapser which produces a long GRB uh, where a massive star dies and I mean and it just it collapses to a to a black hole and it produces uh, very fast jets and a long kind of emission over two seconds of duration. So there are different uh, with the help of understanding of if it is a short GRB, you already know that this is coming from a compact binary merger, and if it is a long GRB, it is coming from a collapser. This was the understanding so far, uh, and then there was uh, and there were supporting evidences too because um, the first supernova association with a long GRB happened in already for supernova 1998, uh, and then it was the historical first GRB that was a long kind of GRB showing a supernova kind of emission. And what do I mean by supernova kind of emission is that if you look at their optical light curves, by light curve I mean how many photons you are receiving and you measure them over time. So in this left plot, uh, you are seeing that there is this uh, magnitude, the optical magnitude and the time in the x-axis. So the lines, the solid lines or, or the straight lines that you see which are not data, it tells you the theoretical model predictions. So the model predicts that it should be a kind of a fall of the counts, let's say, or your intensity. Now what you see all of a sudden is there is a brightening at later times, even after 10 days. So this brightening tells you that there was a supernova associated with this GRB, and, and this, is a, this is a collapser kind of event. On the other hand, if you have a neutron star neutron star merger, meaning that two neutron stars colliding in spiral and colliding together, they can produce a metastable neutron star. They can also produce uh, 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 an accretion disk with a black hole and it can end up in a black hole or it can end up in a stable neutron star. And the observational signature for that is a short kind of GRB with a duration not less than Two, uh, with a duration less than two seconds. So what is the observational signature that you can get out of this uh, compact binary mergers? The first thing is that the, you can have, you may have a GRB with duration which is less than two seconds. And you can also have gravitational waves because if you produce this kind of a, a collision between two neutron stars, it is, 
if by theory, it is predicted that you can have a gravitational wave event. Now, so it means that you can is you can completely validate your theory so far that you know uh, which concerns the short GRVs and neutron star neutron star mergers or a neutron star black hole merger. You can probe them by observation of gravitational waves. And so far, we have amazing facility, which is called LIGO Virgo Kagra interferometers, which are placed one in the US, in Livingston. The other one is in uh, Hanford. And the third one is in Virgo Kashina, which is in Italy. So, so far, we did many observations with in different observation runs. Namely, I think you already know this, but, but let me remind you again, because I saw that there were previous speakers who talk about gravitational wave events, but, but I think this, this is a very good exercise to, to listen to again. Okay, so the first one was O1 observation, and then there was uh, from 2015, 2016. Then again, after a break, we started from 2016 November until August 2017. The third observation run was in 2019, April to March 2020. And over the time, the detector, and there was a huge COVID break, and over the time, the detectors evolved with the with better sensitivity. So right now, uh, we are lucky that the we, we have, in May 2023, we are going to start our fourth observing run as scheduled, and with a very, very, I mean, with, with a significant amount of uh, sensitivity increase. So here in this plot, this is, uh, I mean, it's a it's a bit of scary plot if you are if you didn't see it before. It's a it's kind of a sensitivity plot we call it. In y-axis, uh, again you don't see my cursor like it, but but here in this plot uh, on the okay I'll just like say by voice. So on the left plot uh, on the bottom panel you have the LIGO sensitivity. By sensitivity I mean that what is your um, I mean if a signal which is your gravitational signal is louder than this noise curves. These are the noise curves. If it is louder, then you will be able to observe this. And on the right, you have the same for, for the Virgo uh, facility. So as you can see from 02, 03, 04, you increased your sensitivity. And also you have a bigger volume of the universe to see. So in, in uh, astronom as astronomers, we convert our distances in terms of megaparsec because we cannot deal with, always we cannot deal with uh, huge numbers of 10 rays to the something. So this is why we convert the, them, those numbers, the distances into megaparsec. And in terms of megaparsec, uh, you, can, you can think this as a volume of the universe in general. So the O4 run, which is going to start from when from May 2023, you can um, you have a better uh, coverage of the entire universe that you can see. So meaning that like for O4 run, O3 run, sorry, for O4 run that is going to happen, you already can cover a factor of uh, a few uh, volume of the universe that you have seen from O3 run. And then today, and then in this slide, I will talk about very briefly about what was the achievement that we made in 2017 that started the multi-messenger era. So as I was mentioning that in 2017, we had a short GRB, which is GRB 17017A, which you can see here. So this is a light curve again, light curve meaning the uh, meaning the the flux, how it is varying with over time. So in the y-axis, you have the event rate, which is counts per second, meaning that how many photons you are receiving in this particular band. Here I'm talking about Fermi GBM, which is a telescope operates in 10 to 50 keV. Uh, I mean, this light curve is made in 10 to 50 keV. And so this is one band of the X-ray. The next band of the X-ray is 50 to 300 keV. So in this two band, if you look, this, this is event rate. So number of events that you are receiving over time, all of a sudden you can see that there is a rise in the counts, meaning that you started from a particular patch of the sky, you started to see more number of photons than expected with the background. So this red line is a background. So it means that we started to see a GRB like event, which is a short kind of a GRB because it lasted over few seconds. 
And this was also confirmed by Integral Telescope, which is one more telescope that was operational at that time. And on the bottom panel, you have the uh, frequency uh, image of LIGO Virgo Kakra. And uh, you can see that there is a there is a gravitational wave that we are seeing. So the gravitational wave. So this the entire patch that you are seeing is the trail how the neutral star neutral star merged over over time. And then this is the time of the merger. And after almost one slightly more than one seconds, you already have a GRB, which is a short kind of patch, short kind of GRB. So what is happening here is like you you are having two neutral star neutral star merger, and as a result of the merging event, you have a short GRB appearing. And this was the first time that we observed that a short GRB can be associated with a gravitational wave event, as predicted by the theory. Um, however, there are some caveats, meaning that the, um, the discovery of this uh, the GRB was very faint in, uh, in flux which we do not see in overall GRPs. But anyway, this is kind of a milestone that was uh, that was set for electromagnetic counterparts of gravitational waves. Because here in this case, we are seeing the uh, gravitational wave and a short GRB from Fermi GPM. At the same time, we also saw the kilonova associated with the short GRB in the optical band. Uh, sorry, can I ask one question? Yes, please uh, go ahead. So, uh, in the bottom panel, I can see that this is in negative time. Yes. I, although I cannot read the uh, x axis properly. So, time from mergers, I guess. Yes. Okay. Yes, it is. So, why it is so? Why it is in negative time? Yeah. So, okay. In case of the um, in case of the triggering events, let's say for case of transient events. We mark our time as uh, trigger time. So everything we convert into trigger time. So we set our time reference as a, as a trigger time when the gravitational wave event happened. So that is our trigger time. And whatever time is before, uh -huh. we call we we just like we subtract it. So that this is why it is in negative terms. So imagine that I say that now, right now, there is a GRB happening. So this okay. will be my trigger time. So whatever uh -huh. happened one hour ago. Uh -huh. really negative. We will represent oh. it as minus one hour, okay. and then so this is our reference time. Let's say okay, so in okay. this case, the this this black vertical solid line is mm -hmm. our trigger time. Oh, okay, got yeah. it. Another uh, just to mention yes. that the pointer is not pointing the proper panel. Unfortunately. Yeah. Yeah, uh, I'm very sorry for that because uh, I'm sharing my screen from PDF and I don't know, maybe there's something weird happening. Yeah, maybe. Yeah, yeah I'm very sorry for yeah, that. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. Okay, I'll just, uh, then I'll go ahead. Yeah, well, okay. Okay, so, yeah. So this neutron star, neutron star uh, merger event of, of 2017 really opened up a huge possibility over um to us because we have seen that there was a neutral star neutral star merger and then we have seen a short grb after uh, one second after a bit a bit more than one seconds we localized that event with the help of our gravitational wave and the electromagnetic counterparts with and then we narrowed it down that the location of the of the grb of the gravitational wave that is coming from is into this in in certain patch of the sky so that localization was done within five hours and this is how astronomy works in general so if we are interested to do in as do astronomy this is how the this is the logical flow that that, that goes and then after 10 hours of this uh, of this trigger time of having a gravitational wave we have the uv optical and near infrared kilonova so we started to see this uh, i mean the theoretical light curve that light curve, meaning the, the number of uh, photons that we expected in the optical band suddenly got bumped up. And this is already this is already predicted by as a product of the neutron star neutron star merger and giving us a kilonova. After nine days, we saw the first X-ray light that we uh, we saw with the help of the X-ray telescopes. And we saw also radio afterglow after 16 days of, of the of, of the historical event. 
So this opened up uh, thousands of possibilities um, of, uh, yeah, and then, yeah, so this, this GRB that we saw was not really a typical GRB. Uh, it was one of the faintest GRBs that we can, that we saw uh, ever with the, with the telescope. So, okay, I'll just like explain with, the, with my voice because of the problem with the pointer. The pink point that you see at the bottom of both of the plots is our GRB, GRB, to GRB 17017A. As compared to the other GRBs that we see in the plots, plot produced in the LISO, which is meaning that the luminosity of the GRB or how much energy the GRB is giving away per second as a function of the redshift. Of course, the GRB that we saw was very close by, but its um, total energy output or the energy output rate was uh, was fainter as compared to the other GRBs. And this is the scheme that we we know so far. There was this uh, two neutron star on the left side. You can see that there, there was uh, two neutron star neutron stars merging together, producing a jet. And there are two kinds of components that we expect in the optical light curve, meaning that the optical light curve that you see in norm in cases where there are no such uh, binary neutron star merger, but normal afterglow of the GRB, as I was saying, uh, uh, producing by the deceleration of the shock. On top of that, you already see there's a bumping up in the, in the optical um, magnitude, like the, the apparent magnitude. And there are two categories of it. One, which rises very fast and also decays down very fast, which is called the blue component of the kilonova. And then we also have a red component, which grows, uh, very, grows fast, but then decays very slow. And we observe uh, both of the components in 17017. This, this revolutionized our understanding of, uh, of GRB physics and the compact binary merger in general. We have seen the uh, relativistic astrophysics in play with several telescopes participating in the observation. We have seen the radioactivity power transients in terms of kilonova. So if you if you see that there is a kilonova, you can also you can probe the nucleosynthesis that is happening inside, and then you can also say things about the enrichment of the universe with different elements that we see today. Uh, of course, it gave huge opportunity to the to to the community of nuclear matter physics because. Uh, in order to see what is inside an, an, uh, a watermelon, you need to break it, right? Otherwise, how do you see it? So, and this is how we, we call it. If you want to see what is inside a neutron star, you need to merge, merge it somehow. And then you rip it off and you see what is inside. So this is one of the events which told us uh, what is inside a neutron star. We probed cosmology and we also saw how the compact objects evolve over time through the merging. Now, what we are expecting in the next observing run of live Okagra, which is going to start from 2014 May, which is in, uh, in one and a half months away. So we are very alerted that we need to put all our efforts together from the electromagnetic side. By electromagnetic side, I mean from opti radio, optical, X-rays, and high energy, very energy gamma rays. So we need to put all our efforts together in order to see if there is a possibility of observing one of these events again in different wave times. So the next observing run is going to start from May, and uh, we are going to see a bigger volume of the universe. So imagine that in our last run, which is which was O3, we saw over the uh, volume with the, with the distance, which is 140 megaparsec. And then if you make, uh, and then this volume goes over uh, R cube, of course. And then in the O4 run, we are improving up to the distance of 200 megaparsec, which gives you three times bigger volume of the universe, meaning that you have even, you will have more events to observe of this kind. And we have almost tens of events to observe each year. And how prepared are we? As we were saying that we need to be ready with all the observations that we can uh, that we can do. So recently we wrote a proposal with Indian Institute of Technology Indoor, where we agreed to uh, and the the final proposal uh, after the acceptance was also uh, 
um, uh, I mean, also resubmitted. And we got 15 hours of observation during the 04 run. And uh, we are collaborating with IIT Indore and, and many MSc and BSc students, uh, many MSc and PhD students there. And uh, the question now is like, are there any new discoveries or news that can help that can help us better understand this kind of objects? And the answer is, of course, yes. Recently, as I was mentioning in one of my initial slides, we recently saw one of the fascinating GRBs, GRB 211211A, where we saw the uh, we saw that this was a kind of typical long GRB meaning the duration was more than two seconds. As you can see from the left top plot, we have this, uh, this from SwiftBat, which is, in, which is the X-ray telescope. And it saw that the, the, the emission that was happening was extending up to 30 seconds. And this was categorized in different technical ways that this can be called as a long GRB with different categorization that we do. I'm not going into detail. And, uh, the distance of this GRB was 350 megaparsec, and uh, the galactic, the center of the of the GRB was eight kiloparsec away from the from the center. Okay, so now what we have seen is that, as I was mentioning repeatedly, that there was this theoretical deceleration of the shock which produces the afterglow. On top of the afterglow in the optical band, we saw a bumping up. So all of a sudden there was a flux rise in the optical band. This is this can only be done with the help of, uh, I mean, this can only be interpreted uh, with a kilonova or a supernova. In this case, we saw a super, we, we saw a kilonova, which appeared um, in, in as a, a very similar to GRB 170017. I mean, in this, uh, so in the y-axis, you are seeing the, the apparent magnitude, and then in the x-axis, you are seeing the days from the trigger. So if you look at the, the broken line, the dotted line, this shows us the 170817 like um, kilonova. And on the solid lines, you are seeing the kilonova that we saw for GRB 211211A. And they are matching very they're matching fair, fairly well. This means that this was a 170817 like kilonova event that we saw here. So what does it Yes. I have one question. Yes, so, yes, uh, how do you detect uh, kilonova and what is supernova? What is the difference yeah. between two? Yeah. Usually, what happens is like the characteristics of the supernova are different than from the kilonova. However, both of them are a bump on the optical mm -hmm. light curve. So, if you observe the light curve, you will mm -hmm. see usually there should not be any feature. But if you see a feature, then that can be associated with a with a kilonova or a supernova. In this yeah. case, this was uh, this was fairly, uh, I mean, simple to understand. This was a kilonova emission that we were seeing. Is there any difference in energy so that you can detect it is supernova uh, or no, it, kilonova? Yeah, it, it's mostly about the time when it is appearing. So for okay. the supernova, supernova appears much later. Mm -hmm. in, in okay. Cases, okay. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, so from there we understood that there was a kilonova. However, I will go back to the things that I discussed before. So what happened is like the kilonovas are, are usually associated with the with the short GRP. And this case, the GRP was longer of, of 30 seconds and even more. So then that, that raises the question, if all the GRPs that we are seeing, which are of long type, uh, I mean, can we exclude all of them uh, that they are not produced by uh, by the by compact binary merger event. So there is a clue that this event is coming from a compact binary merger. However, producing a long GRP. So this raises a, a lot of questions about uh, how we know so far about the classification of the GRBs. So meaning that we should really look at the classification in a different perspective. And calling the GRBs by long and short is not enough to classify them. Okay. On top of that, our discovery was uh, was here. So we have the Fermi Large Area Telescope, which is called Fermi LAT, which observed the sky in uh, 100 MeV to hundreds of GeV. And in that band, we have seen that before this GRB happened, we didn't have any signature, which you can see on the top left panel. There was nothing. 
So the bottom color scheme that you're seeing uh, is the, it, it tells you the significance of detection. So if the significance of detection is more than 10 in this unit, this will tell you that there was a detection. So as you can see from the left panel, there was nothing, no significant emission. On the middle panel where you see, you are seeing a fuzzy blob, that was, that means the significance was more than 10. It means that there was some emission coming in the GV band. And on the right side, you are seeing that this is after one day of the GRB thing again. So it means that during the time of the GRB, we detect discovered some component in the GV band. And this is our discovery that, that was presented um, in Nature and, uh, last year. And on the bottom panel, you are seeing how the flux, on the left, you are seeing the light curve, meaning that you have the flux versus time as growing with the upper limits and there were data points. So it is going, uh, like it is gradually decreasing. And on the right panel, you have the spectrum, meaning how the energy varies, uh, how the flux varies over energy. So we discovered this over, um, oh yeah, so we discovered that during the GIP uh, happening, we discovered the GV component. And this is again, the, the modeling of the light curve and the spectrum and the typical modeling cannot really accommodate the, the signal that we are seeing, as you can see marked by the red arrow, both in the light curve, meaning the flux varying as a function of time, and both uh, and also with the flux as a function of energy so we cannot accommodate this excess so what we described in the paper what could be the possible reason is that there is a, there is a there is this kilonova photons which are available which are getting generated and then also probing inside the um, the jet itself. So there is a jet, and there is this kilonova photon. The kilonova photons are penetrating inside the jet and getting upscattered, meaning doing a, a, a inverse Compton scattering, and then moving the photons up to the GV energy band. So this is how we can. This is the only way. I mean, this is one of the possible ways to detect a GV photon from these events. And if we invoke that kind of a model we can fairly explain the excess that we were seeing before. And on the left, you can see that invoking this component can give you the excess that, that was needed. OK, I think uh, I'm running a bit slow on time, so I will skip uh, a few slides from here. And then I will discuss about the gen uh, next generation gravitational wave astronomy that we are expecting. Because with the discovery of this uh, GED component, we are now searching in different in different, for different patch of the sky if we have missed any of the GV components. However, it is also interesting that uh, if LIGO Vilco Kagra was operational at that time, it probably gave us some hint about the gravitational wave. Now, this is very limited at the moment because the, if you remember from the first part of my talk, I was describing about the localization of such some events, meaning that how do you understand if there is a patch of the sky where this gravitational wave or the electromagnetic counterpart is coming from. And this should be prompted by the gravitational wave detectors. Right now, LIGO V Gokagra prompts us to 1000 square degrees, which is a bigger patch of the sky. However, in next 10 to 15 years, we will have better sensitive telescopes namely Einstein telescope, which is a triangular detector, xylophonic structure, with low frequency response, meaning that you will have better sensitivity in the low frequencies. Right now, LIGO Vico Kagra operates in 10 hertz, uh, 10 hertz up to one kilohertz around that frequency. But Einstein telescope will go even farther, down to one or two hertz, two to three hertz, and this will give us a huge benefit. Uh, this is the uh, this is the Italian or European. Uh, project at the moment. This is a third generation gravitational wave detector. However, sooner we will also have the uh, 3G US venture, which is called Cosmic Explorer. And the US projected the uh, I mean, US, US has a possibility to make the L-shaped detectors again. As you remember, the LIGO Virgo Kagra uh, detectors are L-shaped. And uh, US is right now is also uh, 
is proposing an experiment called Cosmic Explorer, where we will have 40 kilometers of length of each L. Right now, in uh, we are we have of the order of two to four kilometers. So there, there's a huge improvement over what we know what we have so far. And this is the expected sensitivity. So you can see that the uh, in this plot you have the sensitivity again. Uh, mentioning that if you have a signal which is rising on top of these curves that you see you will get the signal detected now for the present generation facilities we have Virgo LIGO and Kakara and you will improve over by uh, uh, an order of magnitude in all the frequencies that you are seeing so in the x-axis are frequencies so LIGO Virgo Kakara is more sensitive in 10 to kilohertz man but Einstein telescope will go in the lower frequencies. And that would give us the opportunity to see the neutron star, neutron star margin during the in spiral phases. As you were, as probably you were remembering, there was a curve which was going up uh, and then uh, and merging together. I'll, I'll show you here very quickly. Yeah, here. So as you could see that there was this, uh, even before the trigger time, they were inspiring. So this is the inspiring phase that was uh, that was happening. So Einstein telescope will, so in the bottom the bottom panel that you're seeing in a, in a very curved way. So Einstein telescope will see this even better. Um, yeah. No, sorry, went too fast. Yeah. OK, so of course, uh, there will be facilities available uh, in the very high energy gamma rays. Uh, we talked about high energy gamma rays in GEVs, but very high energy gamma rays meaning over hundreds of GEV up to tera electron volt. And just to give you uh, an idea that CERN right now operates uh, around a few TVs, but in astrophysics, we all, I mean, let's say the humankind uh, could, make, uh, could make the facilities which can accelerate particles up to a few TVs. But we already know that the universe can accelerate particles up to multiple TVs or even PV energies. So the universe is, is already uh, an exper uh, experimental ground that we can already learn from. So we have the facilities already to observe the tera electron volt energies. And these are, one of them is magic telescope that I made my thesis, my doctoral thesis with. And there will be upcoming facilities called Cherenkov Telescope Array. And one of the telescopes are, is already available in, uh, in La Palma in Spain, but there will be multiple of telescopes of different sizes to make the sensitivities even better. So you will even see the dimmer sources and there will be a synergy between, there will be a common ground between the between this electromagnetic uh, TV instruments and the, the gravitational wave uh, facilities in, uh, in 2030, as you can see on the right side, the Einstein telescope and Cosmic Explorer, all of them. And uh, unfortunately, in 2019, we already have, so I'll skip this slide. Or um, in 2019, we will, sorry, we have already seen the energies in TV, uh, the photons in the TV energies observed by MAGIC and HESS telescopes. So MAGIC is a facility in Spain observing the TV energy, photons coming from uh, different astrophysical objects. Also, there is a telescope called HESS in Namibia, in, in, in Africa, which also observes the same, but in different locations. So they are really complementary to each other. And both of them saw uh, like the TV energies coming from the GRVs. And that opened up a new era of era of GRP. That, that, that is a continuation of different eras that I was mentioning before. And uh, recently, last year, in, uh, in October, I don't know if you have uh, seen this picture before, we have seen the GRB of the century, which is called the GRB 221098. And this is called a board GRB. This is called the board GRB, the brightest of all time. And this, this was so bright that it blinded some of the telescopes already. We have seen multiple TV uh, energetic photons, uh, which, which by the claim went up to 18 TV as detected by a detector in China called Lasso. 
So there is a, uh, and so this tells us there are there are still different possibilities to understand and to grow our knowledge with, and this field is never never stops to uh, surprise us. And and actually, we are also writing uh, a few articles about this GRBs and then some discoveries. So th please look forward to it if you are interested in this GRB, GRB uh, physics, because there will be there will be a multiple. Uh, papers, paper release, uh, I think, in next week. So there will be a bunch of papers coming up with the with the discovery of this uh, related to this GRP. And the best place to search for is archive. So I, I, just, I highly recommend if you're interested to pursue your career in astrophysics, you should really check what is happening on archive. I, I can also provide you the link. There will be, there are, so what how it works is like you have a web page, it's like Facebook, but for astronomers or any researcher. So you go there, you click on the recent updates and see, you see a bunch of papers, like uh, 40, 50 papers per day, and you can check what is happening according to your uh, interest. So I highly recommend to the, to, to, to the students to, to go for it. So I will skip these slides and I will, um, yeah, because of the time, I will skip this. And I will go directly to this slide, which, is, which discusses about the opportunities in general. Uh, let me resize my screen so that you see for the better visibility, and which is not happening. But let me try again. Okay, okay. Let me see. Okay, I think this is better, right? Okay. So here I I put the oh, okay. Snap. Uh -huh. Okay, just one moment. Yeah, I was here. I guess no. Yeah, perfect. So the op I will here in this slide I will talk about the opportunities in general uh, and the following slides. So if you, I highly recommend to uh, if you if you want to pursue your career, you can search for different PhD programs that is happening. One of them is uh, GSSI Grand Sasso Science Institute where I uh, am doing my uh, postdoctoral research, and you can find this uh, the detail in the QR code or in this web page. There is a new PhD call open. So if you are interested, you can apply for the for 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 I mean according to your interest, you can apply for these these positions. There's also uh, there are also opportunities in India. You can you can search uh, you can search this QR code, and if you are a master student or a, or a bachelor student, you can find um, there are uh, I mean I, I mean I have my uh, contacts in uh, science or nuclear physics. I did my PhD there, so I can recommend you you to pursue your. I mean, if you want to do a very small project of a few couple of months or three months, you are you are really welcome. And I can. Uh, I mean, we can discuss a common project or, or something, and we can talk to the authorities. Um, here is the QR code. You can you need to formally apply for that, and we, you can find uh, according to your interest. Probably uh, we can figure out something. There are also opportunities in Ayuka in gravitational wave group. The details are in the QR code. I hope this is uh, this is working. I can share my slides later also. So through this IELCA opportunities, you can uh, go also, I mean, once you apply there, you can also, you're eligible to apply for different institutes through our, throughout, throughout the country. So I highly recommend also to go through this. And you can select your different topics of interest. If you are searching for a graduate program, uh, worldwide, I recommend this uh, this website, which is particularly for astrophysics, which is called AAS Job Register. This provides you information about different uh, fellowships, which are um, PhD fellowships and also master fellowships. If you if you are interested, and at the end, uh, this is my contact details. This is my Gmail ID and my website in GSSI and my ORCID ID. So. If you have any questions, any further questions or query, and if you even if you want to uh, participate in some small projects, uh, you are welcome to 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 contact me. So here I will stop and uh, I'll I'll take questions or or any comments that, that you have. Okay, I think uh, I didn't. Uh, well, I exceeded a bit. Yes. <laughs> No, no, it was perfectly fine, uh, Dr. Bishwit. So now uh, I'd request the participants to kindly ask as many questions as possible. Please, please make use of this opportunity. Yeah, even, even if the, there were uh, some slides unclear and I went very fast, so please uh, feel free to communicate.
probably if you have any network issues you may type the questions in the chat box as well we will convey it to the speaker sure i have one question so yes uh, is there any constraint that you have to make the telescope in l format l shape or triangular shape uh, what is the benefit of making in these shapes yeah so the idea of making l shape detectors was uh, due to the polarization of the gravitational waves but if you make them triangular um, you have the opportunity, so the, the thing that we are proposing here with the Einstein telescope is that you will have, uh, if I go back to my slides, let me, let me quickly go back. Okay, a bit more, yes, here. So if you look at the, this, the expected sensitivity, meaning that how the how better you can understand the noise. So these are the noise floors, and you need to have your signal over the noise to detect the signal. Now, for Einstein telescope, we have two different regimes, one being the low frequency part. And okay, my cursor is really, <laughs> okay. All right, so you have the low frequency part mm -hmm. and the high frequency part. So Einstein telescope is a combination of both of the facilities. So actually you will have six, uh, uh, L shape detectors, but not like not 90 degrees, but 60 degrees, and okay. you make a combination of different detectors. So oh, yeah. you have the detector which is uh, which is operating in high frequency and one in the low frequency. That mm -hmm. that makes the complete Einstein triangle. telescope. Yeah, that makes a triangle. Yes. Uh -huh. okay. So and they are co-located, meaning they are at the same place. So the triangle. Mm -hmm. Also, actually, I have a picture. I just realized. So, on the so Einstein's telescope is triangular. Yes, in fact, Einstein telescope is triangular. Yes, so what which is comprised. What yeah, I okay. understood that Einstein telescope works for the low frequency detection, right? And or the high both. frequency. Okay, as well. It's okay, both. okay, yeah. understood. It's the both. So, and Argo, have... Ligo, Kagra, is it for only high energy? In high frequency. Yeah, high frequency. frequency. Yes, yes. Yeah, so okay, they operate it. over 10, 20 hertz. So, yeah, mm -hmm. that limits also the sensitivity. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks. So first you made Bhargo, Ligo, Kagra, and then you added with another L-shaped Bhargo, Ligo, Kagra, and both of them create the um, Einstein telescope. No, no, Ligo, Ligo, oh. Kagra, they are the present generation ones. So th these are the ones that we have at the moment. But the Einstein future. telescope is a future generation oh, one. Okay. So Ligo, Ligo, Kagra has a very short uh, length of, the, of their arms, L-shaped. Mm -hmm. Uh, let's say two kilometers, and Einstein telescope will have ten. Forty kilometers. kilometers. Okay, okay. No, okay. Einstein telescope will have ten kilometers of triangle. So it's a huge. It's like okay. we call it the next turn of uh, uh, of Europe. Uh, uh, mm -hmm. I remember you mentioned once uh, that maybe for some telescope it will be like forty kilometer. Yes, this is called this is the US because uh, okay, okay. US, in US they always wanted to make uh, big things like big burgers and so they also they went so started from like started from Lyco that they have they wanted to also make a, a huge one so, mm -hmm. so forty kilometers okay. yes okay another question I have if I missed I'm not sure so if you go back to the previous slide yes yes this one I'll go back. Okay. Uh, that curve where you showed the gravitational wave ah, yeah, detection. Sure. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, this one, I guess. No? Yeah, this one, yeah, the bottom yes. line, uh, bottom pan panel. So yes. there we can see, I cannot see the full image, sorry. Just Can you make moment? it slightly yeah. up? Yes, yes, just, just one moment because. Um, yeah, yeah, sure. Let me re, re, re scale. So there we can see the rising part, but we cannot see the falling part. Am I correct? Yes, because you don't have any signal anymore. So what happens? Yeah, you're right. That's a very good question. So what happens? Like you have the merging phase of the two neutron stars. Mm -hmm. They collide, they make a black hole. Of course, mm -hmm. if it is a black hole, you don't see this gravitational signal anymore. So the signal abruptly dies down. So on the y-axis, you have the frequency. So imagine that you have two magnets and you make them in spiral. 
or even if you have like a um, kind of uh, I don't know how how do you call it like a, a ball like big one and you make two balls in spiral in in the ball and you just throw them so mm -hmm. initially they will they will have a bigger separation and they will like rotate but then mm -hmm. when they come closer they mm -hmm. will rotate now with a faster frequency right so this is what is happening so in the y axis you have the frequency and then in x axis you have time so initially you start with 50 hertz of uh, of the of the uh, in spiral then then it went very fast and then at the time of the merger you have almost like 300 to 400 hertz so, and then they, they 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 merge together and they make a black hole so and then that stopped so the gravitational wave emission has stopped at that moment and you have and there is hole. there is no frequency there is yes there is or there is so high frequency that there is out of the LIGO wave level okay yes okay yeah thank you welcome Okay, so anyone else? You will please unmute yeah, do, do, and... don't be shy. <laughs> don't be shy. It's fine. I mean, uh, <laughs> it's a very nice, uh, friendly environment. So please ask whatever question you have. Exactly. Huh? So if yes. you are uncomfortable with English, you can go ahead with anything. Yeah, yeah. Really even even well. Bangla. I mean, I can speak very, very fluent Bangla. Bangla, <laughs> yeah. no, no, but this is a very good opportunity. I mean, it's uh, really really very pleasant because uh, I'm, uh, I mean, they are tricky, they are very technical, but but anyway, I mean, you are completely open to, uh, even if you think that I said something wrong, go ahead. <laughs> I'm very happy to know. But but anyway, go ahead with your questions. Uh, yeah, and most of the participants are uh, BSc and MSc students. So like there is no stupid Which is very questions. Good. You know exactly. I mean, there, yeah. there, are no, there, there are no stupid questions, there are stupid answers. Yeah, go ahead even if you like, uh, I mean, very small questions. I, I really appreciate So even if you don't, uh, if you want to ask something not related to the talk, or maybe about yes, your career, absolutely. Or you can also yeah. go ahead. Huh. About your career, you're completely like, uh, I mean, I can totally tell you, I mean, according to my capabilities. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, but one thing is like, I really, I think that, I mean, if you, one should really apply for as many positions as possible because i mean the right now we are having a bloom uh, in the community in astronomy and astrophysics because there are so many things happening for example in 2021 the thing that grb we saw it was never seen before and we got a very high impact journal publication uh, we never thought that we could see gv emission it's energetically very challenging to produce this GV emission, but we saw for the first time and we got a high impact publication. Of course, it's not about the publication, but understanding how it works. The next thing is like the board GRB. Right after one year, we saw the brightest ever GRB that, that almost killed us, by the way. So it was so close that it got an influence over the ionosphere over India. So so mm -hmm. I, I I encourage all the Indian people to, to even... Uh, to study this even further. But anyway, so I mean, we are in a very nice time where everything is converging together. Yeah, so it's a very blooming field. So, okay, if not, uh, let me go ahead with one question. Sure, go ahead. Yes, please. Uh, okay. So uh, I think we have done tremendously well when it comes to applying uh, numerical relativity to modeling the templates of uh, black hole black hole mergers or uh, neutron yes. star black hole mergers or even like uh, neutron star neutron star mergers for like LSAT detectors like the LIGO That's LBT true. Ones. That's true. Uh, yes. So my question is like, will we have to again make the templates for the triangular detector? So that will be a waste of computational time, right? No, it's not because uh, you already uh, okay. Uh, yes, it is, and it's not because if you look at the frequency regime, now mm -hmm. there are theoretical predictions that you need to you need to make templates. Yes, for sure. But we already have templates. So right now, I didn't mention, but like we we uh, I mean I worked with a group here in JSSI that made simulations for the future generation telescopes. 
like I said, okay. cool. and mm-hmm. we have all the templates already ready. So it's not really it's not really a waste of computational time. But um, actually, we are also doing large simulations in general. So yeah, we are revisiting those cases again to understand if there is a merger happening for black hole, black hole, black hole, neutron star, or neutron star, neutron star. What should be the shape of the signal that we expect? Mm-hmm. Of course, these are not complete because we are not considering many. Into many small details, for example, I mean, if you involve spin of the black hole, then the template changes. Mm. So there are different templates, of course. But but yes, I mean, the general, general relativity aspects are are very fascinating for the third generation detectors. We will have more insights. Yes, yeah, that's exciting. Yes. And also adding to that, uh, like how far we are uh, in modeling supernova explosions using numerical relativity. And as yeah, far as that my is. Understanding, but it's not that easy, right? No, no, yeah, yeah. I mean, in in general, the numerical relativity is, is quite challenging, and you need like huge computational power. Although I'm not, a, I'm not a not an expert on this topic. I can I can already tell you that uh, I mostly deal with the electromagnetic observations, the counterparts in uh, optical, mm-hmm. radio, uh, X rays, etc., and up to very high energy gamma rays. But yes, the new, uh, I can only tell you that these are challenging, but there are there are really huge groups in Italy, and uh, I know for sure that they are doing this. They are even, uh, I, I know that there is, a, I mean, if some of your students or if, if you're interested, you can check the papers of uh, Padova people. There is University of Padova, mm-hmm. and Riccardo Cholfi, I mean, he's, uh, he's really, I mean, they are doing a lot of work on this, on, on particularly for BNS mergers, but, but yes. So there, there are efforts. Let's say. Excellent, excellent. So okay. Okay. Uh, so uh, yeah, it, it it's a very raw question, but uh, I would Please, like to uh, ask you something about uh, this data analysis part. Like uh, uh, from what I have understood, uh, it generates a huge loads of data. So and yes. uh, like with the new technologies that are coming up, like uh, machine learning, the AI yes. and those things and yes. all. So, so how do you think uh, these are going to impact? Like, uh, will it be very fast? Uh, I mean, the interpretation of data that you do. I mean, yeah. is it going to uh, take a lot of less time in future? And how, what is the prospect mm-hmm. basically? Yeah, it's a very good question. Very good question because uh, because this also cued me to to uh, to just like shed light on on one topic, which is like if you if you are really willing to do some science with publicly available data. So the discovery that we did was with publicly available data. NASA has a huge um, web page where you can access all the data for free. So if some of your students wants to do some small projects with the data analysis. It's already there, so I can already give some uh, links around, and uh, they can start doing their uh, small project with the with the different telescope, even for me, like for me, GPM. It's it's already public, so then all the NASA NASA missions are all public, most of them. And so this is this is the first part of the thing that I want to talk. Uh, the the second thing is like as you asked, this is a there is a huge challenge on the data processing, of course, because there will be I don't know petabytes of data per minutes even per seconds then the question is uh, for example cherenkov telescope array that i was mentioning there we have two gigabyte of data per second the raw data it means it's a huge amount of data and how do you store it you store it locally and then you transfer it to other uh, other uh, local facilities the computing facility that you have and with the future generation which Cherenkov telescope array the it's it's a complete new research it's also a kind of a new uh, frontier of research how do you deal with the data because in Cherenkov telescope array you will have of the of hundreds order of more i mean two order of more um, available data so we reprocess this data and store the value information we have the answer is like it could be tricky because uh, there could be some data where where you you want to go back and and then reprocess and try to see because there are for example there are certain events as you are seeing here this signal i mean this slide that i'm showing this gravitational wave signal was more than the signal to noise ratio that we expect of 10 12 but then there are certain gravitational wave event which are less than 10 of signal to noise ratio but they are they they also could be valid uh, coming from valid astronomical op- uh, phenomena, so it means that you should not discard your data. You should like you should keep the data. 
the balance because you cannot really keep all the data. So, I mean, there should be like a yeah. first order cleaning up the data and then you throw all the data away. But this is already a huge research topic. So this is called the data acquisition system. Uh, um, yeah, so DAQ, data, uh, yeah. So, and then this is a, I mean, I think, I mean, there is a huge opportunity to do to do big data in general, even with Einstein Telesco and CTA. So okay. uh, I don't know if, if that was, uh, that, I mean, that is exactly what you wanted to know, but like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah, yeah. I, I got the idea. <laughs> I mean, yeah, yeah. Of course, for the later part of the data analysis, we, we right now, all the collaborations are trying to implement machine learning because it's much faster. So mm -hmm. this is the second part of the research that people are doing at the moment. Okay. Incorporating so, machine uh, learning and, yeah. All right. All right. So probably yes. uh, that's why a bit in a group, you will find computer scientists as well working with parallel with the physicist. This is true. This is true. Even uh, just to just to tell you about like our group, we have also geophysicists because we need to okay. understand how the earthquakes are uh, uh, altering our data. Because uh, I mean, how, how do we see this gravitational signals? If there is a, there is a huge earthquake happening, we will see some okay. fake signals. Even yeah. we can detect the ocean waves coming from uh, different directions. So mm -hmm. we need to understand how our uh, how how this is happening in general. So we, we okay. our group comprised of um, uh, geophysicists, data analysts, like hardcore data analysts, and then mm -hmm. big data uh, people, astrophysicists. So it's as a combination. So astrophysics right now, as we know of, is a combination of many many topics. It's a it's a mixture of many things. Yeah, I think that's what makes it interesting, right? True, true. And that, that, that's what makes us grow. Yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah, correct. Yeah. So uh, I think, yeah, we have uh, probably, I think uh, one participant raised her hand. So I would ask her to kindly unmute herself and ask the question, please. So what is TV? Yeah. Uh, hi, Aparna. So the, so you mean, uh, sorry, sorry. I, I, did I hear you hear it well? Like TEV? Uh, yes, I think sir. it's PEV. Or T E V. Yeah. So T E V is a tera electron volt. So you have imagine that you have the mass uh, of objects which are like uh, as we know like proton and electrons, um, and then you have like M E V, let's say energies. But when you go to higher energies, like orders of magnitude more, you have first of all you have giga electron volt. And then the next decade, like 10 to the three, again, more, you have tera electron volt. So, so let's say tera electron volt is uh, 10 to the, how much it should be? 10 to the, uh, okay. 10 to the three is KV, six is MEV, and then you have GV, which is nine, and then 12 is TV. So 10 to the 12 electron volt is TV. 10 to the power minus 12, right? No. Or 12. Two, plus 12, okay. Yes. <laughs> Yeah, so oh, yeah. let's say <laughs> any more participant. Sorry, Aparna, you are saying okay. something? Oh, yes, please go ahead. I thank you. Yeah, no worries. So yeah, it's a uh, okay. So so the thing is like CERN right now, their center of mass energy that they can accelerate the particles is around tera electron volt, like uh, five, five to ten tera electron volt. I don't know exactly right now. So this tera electron volt energies they produce with this huge facilities that they have. What I was saying is that in astrophysical objects, you already get plenty of tera electron volts of energy for free. Like it's just like it's having a shower on top of us. So we have all the astrophysical sources bombarding us with tera electron volt energies. So this this also tells us how beautiful our nature is or how how well I mean. Yeah, so it's fascinating, isn't it? Okay, uh, do you have any more questions, participants? Maybe any career related questions? Yeah, yeah, please go ahead with the career related questions because this is very important. <laughs> No, because I, I would like to tell you that, like, uh, when uh, we were doing our bachelor or masters, um, our, 
I mean, in Kolkata, things were a bit closed, so we didn't know what is happening outside. So there were no direct connections. So even if you wanted to do uh, build your career as a scientist, you didn't know the global picture. So it's good that you have uh, uh, Himanshu and Apurva who are really uh, enthusiastic about research, like was like pushing you, uh, not pushing you, but like uh, uh, like giving you hints, clues to what is happening in the rest of the world, which is very important. And uh, you should take these opportunities, uh, I mean, as as maximum to the maximum. So only it was during my PhD when I when we started to know that there is a huge community outside India who are doing fascinating research. But it's good if you already are aware. And then you can already apply for PhD in other countries, which is a good thing because you have better funding. Uh, I cannot really just say, but OK, anyway, let's say that you have better opportunities. And uh, and then you have uh, you have very good collaborators also. So you should really go for uh, for opportunities wherever you can. Uh, speaking of uh, career opportunities, so like I'd like to go ahead with one question. So since you are yes. in Italy and uh, there are MHPC courses, right? Yeah, yeah, they have one uh, program at ICTP. So like, what are the prospects yes. of HPC graduates in uh, getting absorbed in uh, like uh, astronomy and also maybe in the industry? Yeah. yeah. So, so um, basically, in in ICTP, there is a program called. Uh, it's kind of an exchange program. So, if you are from certain countries, they can invite you and they can provide all the all the monetary help that you might need. So, there is already a, an opportunity. So, I think it's a very good one. But I think for that, you need to be a. If I'm not very wrong, you need to be a PhD student, or you're you should already pursuing your research. Uh, if I'm not very wrong, but I know a lot of people who already went, uh, who already participated in this program. So I can totally ask and uh, and and tell you. But this is this is for, for probably for ongoing research. That there is an exchange of ideas for one month or so. So you can they can already fund you, and you can spend one month completely in Italy in CISA in Trieste, and uh, this is how it goes. But this is a very nice opportunity because ICTP is uh, one of the um, like uh, brilliant places where you can you you have interdisciplinary um, science activities. So yes, mm. it's exactly. Nice. Yeah. Like Trieste has a very uh, diverse research culture, right? Yes, yes, because you have many. So in general, Trieste is said to be the most uh, dense population of uh, intellectuals in the world, because in one city. You have three different research institutes, ICTP, CISA, and something else that, uh, that I don't remember at the moment. So it has the highest density of, uh, of intellectuals. <laughs> so yeah. Yeah, I think uh, if there are no further questions, probably it's time to. <clears throat> so Himanshu, what do you say? Uh, yes, yes. Uh, since we have uh, started uploading uh, the vid uh, videos, the recordings on YouTube, the turnout has been a little less. But anyway, I'm sure uh, this talks <laughs> reaches about uh, 80 to 90 participants, or probably more. So they view on YouTube at their own convenience. Mm -hmm. Anyway, uh, I think this has been a very useful session, and this will be a useful session for those participants who will view it on YouTube. So, Pavada, maybe we can end it, right? Yeah, yeah, Imanshu. Uh, I think before ending, let me present a vote of thanks. So, uh, yeah, I'd like to thank uh, Dr. Biswajit Banerjee for delivering such a wonderful talk. Uh, I mean, the way you delivered the talk and the way you interacted, I think it was awesome. And it was a very brilliant learning experience for our students. Also, the information that you provided uh, regarding the gamma ray burst and the underlying physics, actually. So it also <clears throat> helped me to understand a lot about this phenomena. And uh, also, the information that you shared about uh, the prospects in astronomy as a research career, as well as the way the students can really interact with you for projects and such things, I think it will be a lot of uh, it will boost them as well as it will provide a lot of benefit for their future careers as well. 
So with that, uh, I think I would like to thank uh, Dr. Bishwajit for sharing your valuable time with us. And also, uh, in the end, I would like to thank Himanshu, Pintu, and Novendu for all the behind the scenes work. And finally, of course, we have to thank the participants uh, because without their support, this program, it wouldn't have been possible. So I would like to request all the participants to keep supporting us in future as well. So with that, I think I'd like to conclude. And uh, uh, Dr. Bishrit Banerjee, if you have any concluding remarks, please. Uh, yeah, yeah. So thank you very much for inviting me, first of all. And it was a very nice, uh, nice opportunity for me to also express. I hope the talk was not too technical, because uh, I was uh, I was preparing. I mean, I had like a, a group of people in mind who are uh, master students and uh, in in like they're finishing, trying to finish their master career. I mean, kind of that. So I hope that was not too technical. But feel, I mean, as I said before, I mean, feel free to ask any questions with the contact details you have, um, and then feel free to also contact me if you have any questions regarding the regarding the career in general. So yeah, thank you very much for organizing this this amazing opportunity, uh, and, and it was very nice to to talk to you. And all thank the best you, for you. your future endeavors, Apurva and Hwangshu. Yeah, uh, same to you as well, and. Uh... <laughs> uh, please let us know if you come to Northeast. We'll happy to be uh, like hosting you for a talk. Uh, yeah, that will be amazing. Yes. Yeah, yeah, sure. yeah. Because sure. it's it's always a, a very very amazing thing to interact with, uh, like live interact with uh, with with all the students and and, and questions and answers. So it's very nice. So definitely we will we'll stay in, in contact. That's true. That's true. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Bishuji. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you very so much. much. Fine. Bye bye. Take care. OK, bye. Take care. Bye bye.